Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar, a reality check for digital wallet security. Consumers want payment options that function in all channels. Research confirms it. They want to buy things with as little frustration as possible, and merchants want to accept payments from legitimate customers. It's just that simple. As digital wallets emerge, however, security remains the primary hurdle facing mobile payments. How do digital wallets fit into the formula of customer convenience and merchant confidence? To answer those questions, we have joining us today Hannah Preston. Hannah's based in London, and she's a solution strategist in the Payment Security Division for CA Technologies. Hannah, take it away. Thank you, DJ. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Cardinal President. I love the work that you do, and also to all of you that have joined today. And um, it's, I'm incredibly proud of the industry that we that I work in, the innovation that's happening, and, and the, the, the around mobile wallets and um, and mobile uh, innovation. And um, so the topic today is a reality check for digital wallets. And being honest, mobile payments haven't really dramatically changed the way consumers pay yet, but we're really at the start of something that's going to be super exciting, and it's likely to happen fairly soon, which is what I'm going to be covering today, just talking about when that's likely to happen and the scale that we could potentially expect um, for, for that. So if we think back to the early days of online payments, it took roughly 10 years for, for, for internet payments to really take off, and now we think very little of processing millions of transactions on a daily basis. So the thing that's really different now to when online payments started out is that we don't have to wait for the whole market to go out and buy a device that enables them to make that transaction. Billions of people already have a smart device, and 15 years ago, uh, you know, people wouldn't have owned those devices that they could transact on. So we have an enabled market that could just switch overnight, given the right circumstances and the right incentives, etc. Um, the merchants that I talk to uh, tell me mobile commerce is overtaking PC-based internet spending. Some of the merchants that say that they're seeing around 200, 300% increase in mobile generated transactions. And there's no doubt that mobile payments will be adopted en masse. So if we look at smart device ownership, in 2001, which is when 3D Secure uh, was first invented, which is which was invented to facilitate online payments and to give the the market confidence and provide security. There were zero smart devices in existence. The iPhone came to market in 2009, and now around two billion devices exist worldwide. In the U.S., uh, in the U.K., in the U.S., sorry, about 70% of adults own a smart device. And in the UK, around 80% of adults smart, own a smart device. And there's statistics that say there's up to six devices per household. The mass enablement is absolutely key, which is, um, I don't know whether uh, some of you have read in the, in, the, in the press about MasterCard's launch of MasterPass digital payments platform for mobile. MasterPass, MasterCard but MasterPass provides merchants with a consistent way to accept electronic payments regardless of where the consumer might be. So they'll enable things like QR codes, contactless, mobile um, payments, and this will eliminate the need to add detailed shopping and card information to make that transaction. And they'll join the likes of Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and Android. And I, I believe that this is a culture that will, that will happen very quickly. MasterCard says that 80 million accounts will be automatically enabled through issuing, issuing partners and merchants and will be available globally. So they've started rolling that out in the US already and we'll start to see that rolled out uh, across the globe by the end of 2017. So let's imagine that 80 million accounts are enabled overnight and uh, so each of those enabled accounts makes two transactions per month. This would generate 1.9 billion transactions in a year that you don't see in this way today. Let's assume that, that, that that's half, you know, we see half that volume. But when customers realize how simple it is to use, it's not hard to imagine that, that it becomes their first choice to make a payment. 
Security does become a bigger issue, however, as you start to see the volumes of payments increase. At the moment, fraud is quite low and it's not too much of a problem, but as soon as those volumes start to get really big, then it becomes attractive to fraudsters as well and you need to um, implement some, uh, some other um, things to make that safe. But the real key thing is the customer experience. Uh, and, and when you uh, provide a wallet, that, that provisioning process needs to work, and it needs to be simple, and it needs to be secure. So there's a, there's a few sort of gaps um, in terms of what the industry is doing right now. And a lot of issues that, that I speak to have a 3D secure. And I think that there will be a lot more, uh, there's a lot more thought that goes into that pro that provisioning process and making that more refined and, 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 and making that more secure. A problem that we're seeing in the industry right now is whereby fraudsters are actually in possession of the of a real card. They've redirected the post, they've got the PIN number, they've got the card, and, and they're able to buy a device, use their own fingerprint. And we're not seeing issuers um, decline a great deal of mobile wallet transactions because so, they want it to succeed. If you decline a provisioning um, opportunity, then you lose all subsequent transactions thereafter. So it's really important that you have confidence in, in being able to provision that card or, or not provision that card if you think that there's a risk. The, so in, in the 3D secure world, um, we use what's called risk-based approach, which we look at the device, we look at the behavior, we look at known fraud patterns, we have a, a, an intelligent approach to being able to decide whether something is, is, is fraud or whether it's genuine um, behavior. And consumers want uh, it to be simple, and, and, and this enables you to make very, very rapid decisions about whether you think that it's a high risk or not. And so um, risk-based uh, decisioning where you want to make a decision as to whether you want to accept that, that, um, that card is going to be really key. What we do today probably won't be enough going forward. We learned a lot from the US um, when Apple Pay was rolled out and then became available in the UK. Some of our US counterparts suffered up to 600 basis points of fraud, which is, which is, which is high. The UK have done a, a better job of, of the provisioning process, so they, they haven't suffered quite so much. But the issuers that I'm talking to are seeing a, an increase in fraud coming through the likes of Apple Pay and Samsung, etc. Um, the real key thing for issuers and, and, and the payments industry is speed and, and being able to adopt new methods of, 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 of um, mobile payment types, to be able to go to market really quickly, to have a first mover advantage. And you will want to be able to rapidly onboard new mobile payment types. And it wants to be easy and simple, and um, and you also want to be able to have this seamless provisioning process. The other thing that you will want to have is tools for managing multiple wallets. And we were talking, DJ and I were talking earlier on about um, where you know where where we are right now in terms of wallets, and that we're really at the start of where we're going to end up. And it's it's. A, a mobile device currently is the mechanism that, that, that contains all, all the card information or uh, that, you know, that you provision it to, but who knows what we'll be provisioning it to in the future. And so what, a, a wallet won't only exist on something like a mobile device, it might exist on, on other devices. You will, as, as, as it becomes a more critical element of your business, so where you're, where you're making a, a substantial profit from mobile wallets, then you'll need to report to boards and execs and, and etc. will become more important so that you want to see you know, where, where are the kinks in the, in the provisioning process, how many failed payments are we having, what, you know, what more can we do to improve this, this experience and uh, make sure that, um, that, that, that we know what's going on 
with our customers in terms of their experiences, etc. Um, by having your having by managing your wallet in house, obviously you don't benefit from having a consortium approach. So you know there is enormous value in being able to blacklist a device, for instance, or to profile fraudulent behaviour that you're seeing across different issuers on a global basis and on a local level, etc. So by having that um, in-house, obviously you're not able to then collaborate with the market and share intelligence so that you can be more, um, uh, you can defend against fraud attacks that other issuers have, have suffered. Um, so at the moment, it's, it's, it's an exciting time in terms of the payment industry we're seeing of 3D Secure, the, the protocols being updated. A PSD2 is, op is creating a new channel of payments, and then mobile wallets are about to emerge as well. And so what we see in payment security is that you, know, you will want to have a holistic view of all of those different channels, because at the end of the day, it's just a way of, making, of accepting a payment, and customers will want similar experiences across different channels. And, and you want it to be simple in terms of managing and reporting and, and things like that. So that's the view that we're taking uh, uh, from a payment security point of view. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the new protocol, the new 3D Secure protocol. And the reason why I'm talking about it in this context of mobile wallets is because it's all integral in terms of the, the, the technical um, uh, capability of making it happen. So I had a great opportunity to speak to James Rendell, who's our VP of Business Strategy, and ask him a few questions. And also, I've been at the MasterCard conference this week, so I've picked up some information there that, that I can share with you too. There's, there's, there's some stuff that I can't share because um, there's some restrictions around Invico, et cetera. So if you've got questions, um, I, I'll answer what I can, but I might have to be a bit vague on some of them just because we, 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 ha we have to be careful what we say, but I'll share as much as I can with you. So I wanted him to, so I asked uh, James uh, to just point out the difference between the current protocol and the new protocol. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, and technically, it means that if you think about it, when 3D Secure was invented, there were no mobile, there were no smartphones. It was invented in 2001, and the first smartphone came to market in 2009. So the real key thing is that this has been designed around enabling the features of the mobile to be compatible with the mobile, to give an experience that you would expect on a mobile device. So the real problem with the current protocol is that it's really difficult to integrate smoothly into a mobile app, for instance. So if you wanted to authenticate through an app, currently you can't do it, but with the new protocol, you will be able to do it, which is really exciting. Some big merchants that, um, that, that wouldn't have necessarily put, trans put transactions through 3D Secure uh, based on the current protocol are actually very excited and, and can't, are actually asking when can we have it because they've seen early versions of what it's going to look like from a customer experience point of view. So that's very, very exciting. So that's a whole mobile integration capability is going to be massively improved. Um, so the, the real key thing is the, is the redirection. You're not going to have a, a, this issue whereby it has to go to another page and then it pops up. It's all going to be integrated into that, um, into that customer purchasing process. And so I asked him, what will cardholders notice and what is in it for them? And so, so what he said was the key thing is that you get a greater shopping, safe, greater shopping safety and a great, greatly improved customer experience. And cardholders in the majority of transactions should notice very little other than it's, you know, it, it, it will be akin to a, a, a wallet where it's sort of one, two, clicks and, and leveraging the phone's capability and, and we'll see a, that from the customer's point of view they'll just be able to tr transact much quicker. It would be like the equivalent of, of, of current contactless payment in terms of speeding up from that sort of slower process that happens right now um, to a much faster process. So merchants, for, from their point of view, uh, they're really excited. They 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 love 3D Secure because it gives them a liability shift, and also 
it means that um, they get a, a, a better interchange fee and, and different rates across the world. But um, you know, there are incentives for processing transactions through 3D Secure, and um, but, but they do hold back on on mobile transactions because it is such a, a poor experience on a mobile device. You know, in some instances, you know, the the the, you, the the page will be blank or there'll be failed transactions, and merchants all they want to do is just be able to accept that payment and ship their goods, and they don't mind paying a little bit more for a uh, for a transaction that is is more likely to succeed. So they're really excited at the opportunity of having a, a, a really slick, great customer experience that they can just you know that, that that does the job and they can take their payments and they don't have the abandonment that they might have otherwise. So um, so they're all very excited and. Um, so we, I asked him about liability, and I think that there's still quite a bit uh, uh, that needs to be done in terms of the schemes to come up with their commercial framework for how uh, the new protocol is going to be, how it's going to be, uh, what the wrapper that's going to go around that. But um, uh, we, we, we're expecting to see the, the new 3D Secure protocol available uh, and being um, implemented next year. Um, so the key problems that you, that will be solved by 2.0 is the mobile app integration. That's the big one, and also meeting the modern demands of consumer expectation for a smooth, seamless, seamless um, experience. So some people say it's been a long time since uh, there's been an enhancement to the original protocol, and we are very confident with it, with Envico running the, the new protocol. That, that all efforts will be made to keep that up to date and adapting to the new environment that, that we're seeing in terms of expansion of connected devices and devices that are going to be capable of accepting a payment. So I, I've, I've, I've kind of got through everything that I had hoped to share with you. And um, DJ, I know you've got a couple of questions that came in earlier in the week, and um, I would. Um, Open to any questions that the audience might want to might want to put forward and um, and, and talk about. Great, Hannah. Great. Uh, yes, we have had a couple of questions come in. Uh, I'd love to uh, ask you a couple, and we'll uh, we'll spend uh, the the uh, the uh, until the bottom of the hour, um, maybe answering a couple of questions. So, the first one that came in uh, said, "I am interested in the future evolving trends of wallets." Uh, from the perspective of security concerns and risk callout, and the future state of fraud mitigation. So, if you could talk a little bit about that, about what you see coming uh, as far as uh, as uh, what will happen with wallets in the future, um, our audience would love to hear about that. Yes. So, as as we as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I think we're at the very beginning of where wallets will go, or or sort of payments in in, in general. So. As I mentioned, we will see, you know, your washing machine and your car and you know, other devices that are enabled that can make a payment. And so, if you think about that in terms of risk, that's kind of scary being held to ransom by your car, for instance, you know, that's connected to the internet that somebody could hack or somebody could access information or, you know. So it's really important that we all do the right thing in terms of security because we love. Convenience. We love technology that enables us to just do all the things that we want to do really easily and simply, and we don't want that spoilt by, you know, um, by by fear, by fear of, of 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 our devices or our our money being stolen. And we do, and and all of the issuers and the whole industry are developing solutions that have solutions that that we are implementing, that we're rolling out, and 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 that. Um, that, that we safeguard these devices. CA are investing huge amounts of um, of, of their of their um, money in in developing you know, the the technology of the future that may that means that we can have this connected and, and cloud based um, convenient um, technology available to us. But at the same time, we have the security that's required to make sure. That we're all safe and, and our money isn't stolen by by thieves. Fantastic. Okay, uh, we do have another one that came in. Um, in 
an environment where uh, preloading a card or a payment account into a wallet is is accepted, the the person wants to know how they can verify whether the card really belongs to the consumer. Is CVV verification good enough for the security that they want to provide uh, to their customer? So that's a really great question. And so I have have a few uh, concepts on this. I so if you're talking about card. A CVV number it, it, on its own is is not enough, um, but you know it's 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 a it's a way you know, that if if they've managed to s steal the um, card information, it's a, you know, they'd have to be in possession of the card to be able to use it on that basis. But it's it, if in the future there will, we we might not have cards anymore, so then you need to think of something else that that's going to be suitable for for provisioning that account or that you know that ID or something along those lines. But I think that um, it, you know, we, we're all moving away from static data because it, anything that you can share or give away um, it needs to it needs to be replaced. We need dynamic forms of uh, authentication. We need to uh, it needs to be something that can't be can't be shared or stolen. So um, I think that um, we'll see a, a shift in our reliance on the CVV number, but um, you know, it, it is a, a form of um, uh, security that, that, that can be useful, but in combination with other things you wouldn't necessarily, you, you want to be in a position whereby if somebody's got the CVV number, but the behavior that you're seeing is indicative of fraud, you want to decline it, even if they've got it. You know, you need to be able to make intelligent decisions, which is why we've invested so heavily in in our data science capabilities. So we're looking at the device. We're looking at has that device been associated with fraud before? Is that behaviour indicative of of fraud? Is that is is that behaviour um, indicative of 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 genuine transactions that we've seen from that customer before, and if so, then we can be more comfortable with that decision. But um, I think that you know anything physical, you need to think about. You need to have a, a risk-based approach on top of that. You need to be able to decide if something's not right, even if all the, they tick all the boxes and they've got the right uh, right information. Uh, if it if it looks suspicious, then then you need to be able to make that decision and you need to have the intelligence to go with it. Is there any more, DJ? Hello? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the, note that the questions uh, have have uh, we've gotten to a point where uh, we should probably uh, end the webinar. The questions uh, you did a, a fantastic job on the uh, on the questions that came in, and uh, we're getting towards the bottom of the hour. So we're going to wrap this up right here. I want to thank Hannah very much for joining us and for taking us through uh, a really important topic on digital wallets and and what's going to be happening in the future and and how companies can uh, can use them to uh, reach out and uh, and engage their customers in a in a more meaningful way. This webinar or recording of it will be uh, available after this uh, on the CA Technologies website. An email uh, will be going out to each and everyone who signed up for the webinar with uh, the uh, ability to uh, access that rebroadcast. So anything that you did not get uh, at this time will be available to you in a recorded session. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and we'll see you on our next event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you.